This is the motor I got from the hand blender that we used in 1192 and 1194. Now, it's a relatively cheap motor, but then what do you expect from five pounds? But it is also really easy to take apart. There's just two press pins right there and right there. You prise them open, you get the motor open. So let's do that. So we can pull that plastic cap off and there we go. These are the brushes right there, and then we've got anti-arcing capacitors on it, and there's the plus and minus feed in. And if we have a look at the motor itself, here is the rotor, obviously, and you can see the permanent magnets there. It's one in the north, and one in the south, and if we can get that rotor out... So we've got the commutator segments, there are 24 commutator segments, and each segment accounts for the beginning and the end of a coil, so there are 12 coils, and sure enough, we have 12 pole pieces here. So when we pass the current down the right commutator, commutator segments, then this becomes a little magnet, and there are 12 of those little magnets inside that rotor. Equally, when we use it as a generator, we have 12 little pole pieces spinning inside that north and south magnetic field. So every time that does one rotation, we have 12 of those little things passing the magnet, or six to each magnet. So here is the machine that we made in 1192 and 1194, and what I've done is I've taken 46 magnets and put them round the edge in a north-south, north-south orientation. So you've got north-south, north-south, north, and so on. Now if you look at this, remember we've only got two magnets in here facing north and south. When we use this, what we do is hold that case steady and spin the rotor. But it's all about frames of reference. It's identical. If I hold the case steady and spin the rotor, it's the same effect if I hold the rotor steady and spin the case. Makes no difference. And that's exactly what we've got here. So if we fix a point there, every time we go that distance, we're moving from a north to a south field. Instead of having to rotate it to do that, we rotate the magnets to move it past a fixed point. So 46 of these means there are 23 norths, 23 souths, so it's the equivalent of having 23 of them. And instead of having you rotate the rotor, what I'm doing is rotating the case. That's exactly what's going on here. So we now have the equivalent of 23 of those mounted on our spinning um, flywheel. And every time I go that way, I move the equivalent of one full rotation of that. So if you'd like, it's like a gearing as well. We now have 23 times more. Because from this point, I have to do one full rotation. And this point, I have to do one twenty-third of a rotation. So it's a bit like we've geared it up by putting the magnets around here in that north-south, north-south configuration. Now, of course, what we need is to consider this section. So if we have a better look at this, we can see that there are 12 pole pieces in here. Now, when it's a motor and they're electromagnets, they're effectively 12 little electromagnets. When it's a generator, 12 coils with pole pieces. If we look at the wire, it's extremely thin, actually, which is no surprise because this is a high-speed, low-torque motor, so lots of thin wire. So we've got, essentially, 12 coils there. Now, people who watch the um, videos a lot will know that I love these things. These things are the coils out of... Um, Turntable motors, actually, there is synchronous turntable motors, and again, there are lots of turns of very thin wire. Now, they don't have a core, and this has a core. If you put a metal core in there, you will get a better result, but something else happens. The magnets will be attracted to that metal core. If you do a coreless coil, then you will get a result which will be less than if it were cored, but you also don't get any cogging. So, it, it's really a decision. Now remember we got about 30 watts out of this when we put that on the um, fan belt and drove it with the fan belt, we could get 30 watts out of it. Meaning each one of those contributed 2.5 watts. Now I've got my coil here, right there, and it's just an open core coil. And we're going to spin it up and see what kind of power we get from one open core coil with these magnets flashing past. Now remember the magnets flashing past is identical to the magnet stationary. It's only point of reference. Anyway, I've got it set up and I've got it on the resistive load, which is a soldering iron. And here is my meter set up in amps. We give that a spin up, we can see how many amps we can produce from that.
Okay, so if you remember on the previous video, 1194, when we stopped turning, the flywheel came to a stop very quickly, and that's because of the cogging effect. Here, even though it's under load, that flywheel will continue to turn because there is no core in the coil. So we got about 28 milliamps out of that. Let's have a look at the voltage on that. We got about 1.2 watts out of that coil. And if you look at the size of the coil, compare it to the size of the magnets, we could easily get 23 coils around there. I mean, this is a much larger coil than is needed, so we could probably get more. However, it is matching the output when we use this thing to when we do this arrangement. Because what I'm trying to say here is that there isn't any mystical arrangements of magnets or mystical arrangement of coils. It's all about speed and torque. If you can get this to spin quicker, if you get more torque on it, you'll get more power out of it, whatever arrangement you have. I like these arrangements because it's easy to actually arrange these things rather than to try to make something like this. Now, we have a limitation on the size of our flywheel. Clearly, we made the flywheel bigger. Now, although we got 1.2 watts out of this, it was coreless, remember. Coreless under load. If we put a core in there, we would easily double the output, but we would have the effect of cogging. The magnets would be attracted to the metal in the core, and that means that the flywheel wouldn't run as freely. So, coreless are great for flywheel applications. If you can do it as coreless and get the same output, that flywheel is going to continue to run. If you do it cored, it's going to stop running. So, I think that the secret in generation isn't to do with complicated magnetic arrangements, wonderful coil designs. I think it's really quite simple. I think it's to do with speed. You're going to pay torque for speed, but the faster you can get something to cross over those coils, then because the power is related to the square of the voltage, the more the wattage is going to come out. Now we did it in a flywheel arrangement because it will con continue to run, but clearly the radius of this is quite limited. A bigger radius, we're going to get more speed and therefore we're going to get a better output. That, to me, is where the generation secret actually lies. Anyway, demonstrating a single coil and what the single coil output should help a lot because all we have to do is take this and arrange those coils around the outside and we'll get ourselves a brilliant generator. Whether you choose cord or coreless is completely up to you. I have a preference for coreless because I like the idea of the flywheel continuing to spin. You don't have to do coreless, you could do cord as well and you'll get a really good result out of it. But like I say, the key to it is nothing to do with arrangements of the magnets. Star-shaped Rodin coils. It's actually really simple. Get it fast, you'll get the power out. Anyway, I hope that was of interest to you. Thank you very much for watching.